Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this Family Bible Study Hour. Two tribulations. That's the subject we're going to be carrying today. Um, a new soundtrack for CDs. Uh, you know, anything that our Father does always ultimately, it may seem negative at the time, but it always ends up to be positive. Okay? So tribulation to a servant of God can be very good. And in the first place, when the tribulations happen, we're right at the door to the end. That's good as far as I'm concerned. But our Father never places more on us than we can cut, that we can handle. As it's written in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, there's nothing will ever happen to you that doesn't happen to other people. It's pretty common. And God will never allow you to be tempted over what you can bear, and He will always show you a way out. That's His promise. When, when you're even halfway trying, God loves you. You're His child. And so, but one of the very serious things, most people only teach one tribulation. That can get you in a heap of trouble. There are two. And if you're not familiar with both of them, you can, you can get in trouble. The first tribulation, of course, is by the spurious Messiah. The second tribulation, it won't last but about that long, and it's from our Heavenly Father. But we have, do you have tribulation today? Well, as a Christian, sometimes you might hear a snicker in a room if you make a statement concerning Father's Word. That's the times, and that's fine. That kind of tribulation will not harm you. So discussing tribulation and why I can say it can be good for you as a servant of God, let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Let's pick it up with about verse 3, and let's see what the Father has to say about tribulation. This is going to be kind of a two-part lecture. Uh, we'll complete it tomorrow. Today it kind of will be as a, on all Christians. Tomorrow it will get more personal down to God's elect. So. Chapter 1, verse 3, 2 Corinthians, and it reads with that word of wisdom from our Father, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort. How much comfort? All comfort. Do you need comfort? You need your Father then, naturally. You know, we would, be, we would have mighty sorry lives if it were not for our Father, His love, Mercy means he's used to giving out unmerited favor. You may not deserve it, but he's there when you ask for it to give you that comfort, that love, that understanding. And quite frankly, for the Christian, all comfort comes from him or the family, okay? The many-membered body. Verse 4, who comforteth us in all our tribulation. You got that? That's very important. I don't want you to read over it. Anytime you're in tribulation, he knows it and he's going to comfort you. It didn't say this tribulation or that tribulation. It says all, all tribulation. Your father will comfort you. That's why uh, tribulation to us isn't bad. That we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. In other words, when God comforts you, you automatically become a comfort to others. You can take care of business. The power and the authority that He instills within us, you can utilize that power, that authority, and, and that comfort to alleviate pain, uh, anxieties, you know, that's just any kind of, any and all tribulation. You, you've got it. Our Father uh, can take anyone through. It doesn't matter. He's willing. He's able. 
But I, I would not want you, I want to emphasize the more important part of that verse. It says, um, we're with we ourselves are comforted of God that um, you may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble. Okay? That's, that's what it's all about, is that you are a servant of God that if someone is in trouble, you can help them. And it's the very presence of God within you, His Spirit, that makes that possible. Verse, um, we'll go with the next verse, uh, verse 5. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. The, um, what this says in a way, the, the more we suffer, the more He comforts. Now, you got that? Don't read over it. Just, just break it back to plain old simple English. The more you suffer through tribulation, the more He comforts you. That's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful that He does that. Now, hey, you have to be willing to open your mind and accept that comfort. You, why not thank Him for it and love Him? that He brings that comfort to you, that you're able to enjoy it. And, and even as somebody's trying to really lay it on you, He's just pouring that love out on you and giving you guiding, guidance, leadership, love, comfort. You know, of course, who the comforter is. It's the Spirit of God, okay, the Holy Spirit. The more you suffer, the more He helps. So tribulation is not bad for God's children. It is an exercise in reality of loving Him and being a child of God, period. Verse 6, And whether we be afflicted, it is for our consolation, it's for our best interest, and salvation, which is effectual, it's good, good, okay? in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer, or whether we be comforted, it is of your consolation or your best interest and salvation. He does it. You know, how, how is your faith? Can you believe that? All you have to do is believe it, and it's a fact, my friend. It's a promise of God, and it is as real as reality every morning when you wake up. Verse 7. And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the suffering, so shall ye also be of the consolation. You're going to be of the, if you suffer, you're going to be comforted. You're going to be partakers of it. He's going to help you. That is his promise. It is written. So why should you worry about tribulation? The stiffer the tribulation, the more helps come in your way. And quite frankly, <clears throat> it is axiomatic that when you have reached your limit, He takes over. He'll, he'll take it from there. That's His promise. There, therefore, you are always able to cut it. That's why you hear me sometimes say, when the plowing gets too deep for other people, that's about right for God's elect. Okay. We can cut it. We can handle it. Not because we're really something, but because our Father is. When we suffer, He reaches down. He takes care. He pours the comfort on. He pours on the understanding. Verse 8, For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, out of our minds almost, uh, above strength. We, we were at the end of the rope, insomuch that we despaired for uh, uh, even of life. Uh, we didn't think we were going to make it. <clears throat> we thought we were going to die. It looked, looked that away. Now, this is a great lesson, and I want you to understand Paul is taking this to the ultimate. He's saying, when we were down in Asia, I mean, it, it looked bad. They were around us. They were threatening. It looked like we were going to die. <clears throat> Verse 9, But 
We had the sentence of death in ourselves, the answer, that we should not trust in ourselves. There was no way we could handle it by ourselves, but in God, which raiseth the dead. We were forced, absolutely forced, to put it in God's hands. Now that's kind of when you can begin to really get something done. It's when you are forced to put things in God's hand and kind of, kind of follow His um, instructions as He has taught you in this letter He has written to you, assuring you, even as He does here in this chapter 1 of 2 Corinthians, I'll take care of you. I'll comfort you. When they lay it on you, when you're doing my work, don't you worry. I'll take care of business. And this is what Paul is saying. When it looked like we were finished, there's nothing else we could do. We put it in God's hands instead of ours. <clears throat> Verse 10, Who delivered us from so great a death, and doth deliver, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. In other words, the, probably, the, let's just translate it into common English. He does it again and again and again. God will deliver you, comfort you over and over and over. What did we learn earlier? The more you suffer, the more He will comfort. The, the deeper you get into something doing His work or in your life as a Christian, He's going to comfort you and He will not do it just one time, not just one day, but in your life over and over again. What a father we have. And sometimes it is just difficult for his mercy, unmerited favor and love that he pours out upon us. That you can't worship him even more and don't ever, ever, ever forget to tell him you love him. He's always faithful. You can count on him. Verse 11. <clears throat> Ye also helping um, together by prayer for us that for the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons, thanks may be given by many on our behalf. That's what prayer is about. That's what, you know, God loves His children, and when His children, prayer is just talking to Him. I mean, when you get bogged down, don't, don't say, Father, I need help. Say, Father, I'm bogged down here. I mean, communicate. Let him know what the problem is. He already knows what's in your mind. You're not hiding anything from him. He knows our very thoughts. Verse 12, For our rejoicing is this. Now listen carefully. Our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience that in simplicity... And godly sincerity, that means to be perfectly, totally honest, not with fleshly wisdom, that's to say the cunning that fleshly wisdom in ways of the world can do, but by the grace of God, the love of God, we have had our conversation in the world. I mean, this world age and, and in the ways of the world, we've been there, we know it, we were threatened. We had tribulation, and more abundantly to you word, uh, dealings in the dealings with you, of course. What he's saying is we experienced all this. You know, this is quite a testimony coming from Paul. Paul, who, as we discussed recently, how he persecuted the church, how he brought tribulation upon the church, and yet God would choose him and use him in this capacity to bring such ever an important message forward about what happens when you're under tribulation. You're going to have more and closer contact with your Father over and over and over again and again. Well, and, and this is why I have, very, I have great difficulty with people that will say, well, the world just always picks on me. Well, they intend to, so what are you going to do about it? Put a stop to it. Get in your Father's will and way. Take His comfort and He'll fix it. He fixes it real good. But Christians are not second-class citizens. We're not welcoming mats for anyone. 
We don't lose ground, we take ground. And Christians have really gone to sleep at the switch by allowing people to remove the name of God from about everything except, uh, well, I won't go there, but anyway, uh, it, it's come to an end. We're going to take ground. I'm tired of this politically correctness letting one little fruitcake uh, do you know what a fruit, well, you're calling names a fruitcake. No, uh, you know why a fruitcake is, they're delicious, but they're nutty, okay? And that's what their problem is, is to try to have one little unbeliever sway a whole group, but it's not going to happen. We're tired of it. We're going to put people in office that will straighten things out and take care of business, Okay. Verse 13, to complete, God comforts His own and takes care of business. He's with us and we're with Him. 13, here we come. 13, for we write none other things unto you than what you read or acknowledge, uh, what you understand. That's all, the simplicity in which Christ teaches. And I trust you shall acknowledge even to the end. That you, um, in other words, let, let, me, let me translate this from the Greek where you can understand. We're going to teach this in a way that you don't have to read between the lines. You suffer tribulation, God's going to help you. There's no great mystery or no secret to it. That's the pure simplicity in which Christ teaches, and that is the truth. So, why would you worry about tribulation? <clears throat> and God... In, I mean, from the beginning in the Old Testament, and we're going to go there in a moment. He has uh, taught us to not worry about tribulation. You know, you take, uh, and, it, and it all points toward the last days. It's for the lesson of this generation of the fig tree. When the three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, refused to bow to a, an image that was 60 by 6, which, you know, that, that doesn't take too much to know we've got the mark of the man, basically. They refused to worship it. <clears throat> and the king, Nebuchadnezzar, who really loved them, he did. He hated to do it, but he, he told them, you've got you to do it. <clears throat> so they threw him in a fiery furnace. He did seven times hotter than necessary. I mean, you have here the symbolic, um, though it was real, symbolically telling you that they're in, I mean, hey, when you're throwing in a furnace that's seven times hotter than necessary, that's tribulation, my friend. That's hot stuff, okay? Do you know what? The king looked into that roaring fire. And he said, how many did you throw in there? And they said, three. And he said, well, I see four. I see those three and I see the Son of God walking with them. God takes care of his own. That's why that happened. To document, when they came out of that fire, their clothes weren't singed, nor even their hair. God comforts in tribulation. You don't have to worry about it. What a loving father we have. All right, Old Testament, a little lesson I want you to learn way back in the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 4 we're going to. <clears throat> Excuse me. We're going to cover this rather uh, quickly, but I think it's important that you know that Tribulation isn't a new thing. It started in the garden. Okay, It's been with us ever since. And God's children don't think all that much about it because of His comfort. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 15. Let's go with it. Take ye therefore good heed unto yourselves, and you be careful to your soul. For ye saw no manner of similitude on the day that the Lord spake unto you in Horeb out of the midst of the fire. In other words, He said... I literally was in a bush and I spoke to you out of that fire and I didn't harm that bush. You got it? God doesn't harm anything but what He intends to. 
lest ye corrupt yourselves and make you a graven image, the similitude of any figure, the likeness of male or female. Now don't, don't ever worship man, okay? I'm going to tell you what, man is man and that's it. Woman's woman, that's it. God's word is God's word, okay? So, and, and there are good men and there are good women. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying, but don't ever worship one. Love them, yes. Worship them, no. 17. The likeness of any beast that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged fowl that uh, flieth in the air. Who are you supposed to worship? Our Heavenly Father, of course. Why? He comforts you in tribulation. The likeness of anything that creepeth on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the waters beneath the earth. Don't worship idols. Don't worship, uh, you know, many might say, well, I, who would ever worship a fish? Well, there was a people that worshiped Dogon. We know the people of Nineveh worshiped a fish god, but you can be a modern day commercial fisherman and worship your catch and money more than you do God. Verse 19, and lest thou lift up thine eyes unto heaven, and when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, even all the host of the heaven, it's magnificent, shouldest be driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord thy God hath divided unto all nations under the whole heaven. He created them and appointed them for us, all of us. Don't worship them. He made them to, he created them to suit himself. Worship rather the creator <clears throat> instead of that that is created. But the Lord hath taken you and brought you forth out of the iron furnace, even out of Egypt, to be unto him a people of inheritance as ye are this day. A people that would inherit eternity a people that would inherit the goodness that this Christ child would come through this people, this family. He said, did he say you escaped it? He said, I brought you out of the iron furnace. 21, furthermore, the Lord was angry with me for your sakes. This is Moses speaking. And swear that I should not go over Jordan. And, and he didn't and that I should not go in unto that good land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. He struck the stone twice, okay? But I must die in this land. I must not go over Jordan, but you shall go over and possess that good land. You're going to go to that promised land too, beloved, if you love him, if you trust him. These things happened as an example to us, whereby we would know what would befall us at the end. Verse 23. Take heed unto yourselves, lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you, and make you a graven image or the likeness of anything which the Lord thy God hath forbidden thee. Don't ever forget God's covenants. That's a marriage contract, even if you want to put it that way. 24. For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. He's jealous. You go messing around. This is why Satan wants you to love him. It makes God jealous. Really makes him jealous. Why? Because he loved you. You're his child. He's, your soul belongs to him. And here you're out here flitting around in the ways of the world, worshiping money, cars, uh, a job, a profession, and cutting God out of the equation and never saying, Father, I love you and thank you for the knowledge and wisdom you've given me. Thank you for the comfort. Hey, he can, I, let, me, let me just let you in on a little secret. God can get along without you real good. He would love to have you in his camp because you're his child, but he can make it just fine without you and all others that fall short. And that consuming fire, it's important that you know that. He is. It's a different kind of fire. It didn't bother the bush. It didn't harm it. It can burn in your heart and be nothing but a comfort to others. It's called the Holy Spirit of God. 
the consuming fire. But at the same time, on judgment day, those that do not align, those that are his enemy, that same consuming fire will be do exactly what it's entitled. What's the title of it? Consuming. Gone. Blotted out. Never to be again. Or it can be warm and loving, toasty to comfort and so that you can be a comfort to others. That's what's important. Do you know people get all carried away with the prayer of Jabez? They say, well, you got to learn that prayer so God will... You missed the whole point. The prayer of Jabez was that Jabez wasn't praying for himself. He was praying for our people. When you pray for our people so that you can assist them, then you're getting down to have your prayer answered. And Jabez has nothing to do with it. Verse 25. When thou shalt begat children and children's children, and ye shall have remained long in the land, and shall corrupt yourselves, and make a graven image, or the likeness of anything, and shall do evil in the sight of the Lord thy God, to provoke him to anger. 26. I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day, that ye shall soon utterly perish from off the land whereunto ye go over Jordan to possess it, Ye shall not prolong your days upon it, but shall utterly be destroyed. 27, listen carefully. This is where you come in. And the Lord shall scatter you among the nations, all the way over the Caucasus Mountains, being called Caucasians, Europe, and then all the way migration to this great nation in the Americas. And you shall be left few in number among the heathen, neither the Lord, whither the Lord shall lead you. Verse 28. And there ye shall serve gods, the work of men's hands, wood and stone, with neither, which neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. And they sure can't comfort. The only way a stick of wood can comfort you is if it's a cold day and you set it on fire. Okay? You can worship it all you want to and you're going to get nothing out of it. Verse 29. You love your father and you get everything. He's a consuming fire that can warm you any time. He is spirit, of course, 29. But if from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, you got that? Seek your father, thou shalt find him. Not maybe, not perhaps, thou shalt find him if thou seek him with all thy heart and with all thy soul. You can't miss. He loves you. Well, I'd just like to have him in my life. Hunt, seek. Find, be blessed. 30, when thou art in tribulation, this is why we came here, beloved. You're going to have tribulation. Rest assured, you're in the world. When thou art in tribulation, and all these things are come upon thee, even in the latter days, that means today, if thou turn to the Lord thy God and shall be obedient unto his voice. Now, that, that is not difficult instructions. That's to you. That's why we came here. For you're in the latter days. You're in the generation of the fig tree. Since the year of our Lord, 1948. It's getting a little gray hair on it. But I just can't understand God. Well, hunt for him. Well, how do I hear his word? Read it. He wrote the whole letter to you through many pensmen and personages. Read it. Study it. Absorb it. And love it. You know, God so loved you that he even sent the word and it became flesh and walked upon the earth, his only begotten son. He didn't say when you're in tribulation, if you'll call on me, maybe I'll come. Maybe you'll find me. But that you would. It's absolute. Verse 31. For the Lord thy God is a merciful God. Praise God for that. He will not forsake thee. Don't ever forget that. Neither destroy thee, nor forget the covenant of thy fathers, which he swear unto them. He will never forget that inheritance covenant. 32, 
For ask now of the days that are past, which are before thee, since the day that God created man upon the earth, and ask from the one side of the heaven unto the other, whether there hath been any such thing as this great thing is, or hath been heard like it. Think about it. Do you have the history? You know. There isn't. There is nothing like it. 33. Did ever people hear the voice of God speaking out of the midst of a fire as thou hast heard and live? Did they, Moses? No. And the bush didn't burn. And he lived. All right, because God is in a different dimension for those that like the scientific side of it. Easy explanation always to God's word. 34. Or hath God essayed to go and take him a nation from the midst of another nation by temptations, by signs, by wonders, and by war, and by a mighty hand, and by a stretching out, a stretched out arm, and by great terrors according to all that the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes? All those miracles performed there, the plagues placed upon Egypt for you. 35. Unto thee it was showed that thou mightest know that the Lord, he is God. Don't ever forget that, beloved. Read it over and over if you have to. The Lord, he is God. There is none else beside him. Not some stick, not some religion, but your own heavenly Father, the reality of it. The closest relative you will ever have, the living God, your Father. He is ever, ever so very, very real. 36, out of heaven he made thee to hear his voice, that he might instruct thee. And upon earth he showed thee his great fire, and thou heardest his words out of the midst of the fire, that consuming fire. 37, and because he loved thy fathers, therefore he chose their seed after them, and even to this day, you to this seed this day, and brought thee out of his sight, which was uh, mighty power, with his mighty power out of Egypt. He delivered, he parted the Red Sea. Verse 38, to drive out nations from before thee greater and mightier than thou art to bring thee in, to give thee and to give thee their land for an inheritance as it is this day. God always takes care of his own. You know, the promise to this great superpower is that we will always, the house of Israel will always control her gates. That's why you don't have to worry. The Panama Canal will always be open to us. 39 to complete this study. Know therefore this day, and consider it in thine heart. You put it in your mind and you let it settle there. That the Lord, he is God in heaven above and upon the earth beneath. There is none else. Well, what are you worried about? You don't have anything to worry about. That burning bush is as real today as it was then. And that consuming fire is as real today as it was then. And he is your father. He can consume whom he wishes, and he can bless whom he wishes. Are, are you blessed? And I know some will say, well, I, I, I don't feel like God blesses me. Then find him. Seek him. He promised, you can find me. Let him touch your heart. Let him lead you and guide you. You've got tribulation ahead, my friend. You're going to need him. He's the one that sends comfort. The rougher the tribulation, hey, the more he blesses. That's his promise. I believe it with all my heart, mind, body, and soul. I've known it. I know it from living proof. Have lived it. Have faced the reality of it. The more the tribulation, the more he blesses. What a heavenly father we have. Don't ever forget it. God is God. Yahweh is Yahweh and there is none other. Don't miss the next half of this lecture, Two Tribulations. It's important. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? 
The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada, Newfoundland. Spirit got, uh, moves, got a question, share it. Okay, please never ask a question about a particular individual, organization, um, or religion. Let's, let's don't judge people. You know, God is the judge. And His Word is complete. It judges right down to the core. And so we don't have to play God. It wouldn't do you any good, and it's the greater sin of sins. So um, let's just uh, study His Word chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Let the old chips fall wherever they may. Those of you that listen by short wave around the world, always a pleasure hearing from you. Your announcer at the end of the hour. We'll give you our mailing address. Now, you got a prayer request, we can do away with the number. We can do away with the address. Why? He knows what you're thinking right now. And you're his child. He loves you. He may not love what you do all the time, but he sure loves your soul. Why? Well, he created you for his pleasure. The documentation for that is the last verse of chapter 4 of the great book of Revelation. If you give him pleasure, he's going to bless you. You think about it. Father, around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father, touch in Yeshua's precious name. Amen. Okay, and we'll get down to some questions here. Valerie from Kansas. Uh, is it God or the devil that who causes sickness? Neither. Neither. We make our own self sick by polluting everything that man touches practically rather than doing things na the natural way. <clears throat> we poison ourselves with gases that um, were hidden under the soil by remains of animals from many years ago called petroleum, oil. And we Boy, let that stuff roar out and smoke. If you all walked and never drove a car, we'd be a lot healthier. But uh, that's not going to happen because we all like our vehicles, okay? And, and uh, walking the distances we travel now would be a little bit impractical. But we poison ourselves. And that's why that um, if, if um, you, to make a full life, uh, it can be... but. And I want to give a warning. Don't ever accuse God of putting a burden on people. He doesn't. And it makes him angry. It's, you can document it in the great book of Jeremiah. It makes him angry if you ask, well, I wonder what burden God's got for me today. He doesn't put out burdens. He puts out comfort. And it hurts his feelings. And I guarantee you he'll fix your wagon if you were to say that. So don't, don't, whatever you do, don't accuse God of bringing sickness. It doesn't happen. And if, as you will note, example in Mark chapter 4, that diseases and evil spirits are separate. They're never the same. The, Satan can send an evil spirit, but he can't send a disease. Okay, Judy from uh, North Carolina. Where in the Bible does it talk about the first earth age? Second uh, Peter chapter three, verse uh, the uh, chapter three. The entire chapter speaks of the three earth ages. 
Jeremiah chapter 4, along about verse 18, where he said, My children are sottish. That means they're just a little bit on the stupid side, ignorant side, that they don't know that there was an age before this and he destroyed it. And then also in the Hebrew manuscripts, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, period. They were beautiful. As it's written in Isaiah chapter 45, verse 18, he created it to be inhabited, not void. But it became void because Satan rebelled, okay? Uh, in verse 2, a lot of time went by between Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Edwina from Florida. You mentioned a herb that was used many years ago to thin the blood. Can you please tell me the name of it? Well, it's really, I don't know if you'd call it an herb or not, sassafras tea, okay? Sassafras is kind of a tree. And um, according to what part of the country you're in, I, in, in Northwest Arkansas, sassafras is uh, kind of like uh, what people would call a sapling. But there are places I've found out in documentaries and from people that it gets to be big trees some places. And, and I was mentioning, you know, it, it's amazing. I mentioned once that this elderly Indian lady that uh, could no longer dig, and I would dig herbs for her at her. Just, uh, but there are many things that are very healing. And I was trying to say of something that grows wild in your yards that is very healing uh, and uh, almost, uh, I don't want to call it an antibiotic and mislead someone, but it's yarrow. Uh, that's what the Indians always use. They, they were pretty sharp on uh, herbs, okay? But sassafras, uh, it, it does thin the blood. Derek from California, is the mark of the beast an injectable thing or is it something of knowledge? It's something of knowledge. The, the mark of the beast is to be, I, I might say, lack of knowledge, ignorant, that someone does not realize there are two tribulations and would fall in line with the first one and think that was Christ come to fly him out of here. And that's what the first tribulation is, is Satan trying to con a bunch of people that haven't done their homework. That's why you don't want to miss the next lecture. It's what's in your mind. The, the, the opposite of the mark of the beast is described very clearly in Revelation chapter 9, verse 4. It is the seal of God in, not on, in your forehead. That's where your brain is. That means to be informed the chronological order of events and how things happen, forewarned by God through His Word. Deborah from Tennessee, Genesis 3, 6. Would you explain this? <clears throat> the partaking of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The knowledge, the tree of life is who? It's Jesus Christ. Well, who is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? It's Satan, okay? Uh, when, for every negative, there's a positive. And when Eve partook of that tree the knowledge of good and evil, and she saw that it was good, and she gave to her husband. He partook of the same tree. That's all the explanation you need. They fell, because why? It was law. God had told them personally, the day that you partake of that tree. The, the etym, you know, I can't help taking just a moment on this. The etymology of the, the word, just like, let's say we got an old apple tree here. And it's not mentioned in Genesis, okay, um, the, uh, in that chapter, is, is the word E-T-S in the Hebrew, etz. But that's not the word that's used in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's atash. Do you know what that is? It's the backbone. That is the trunk or the tree of the body, and these are the limbs. And... Um, uh, it even means the curvature atish of, of the back this is a, a, and an opening of the eyes. This is why Satan said, in the day you partake thereof, your eyes will be open. In other words, you'll know what evil is. You'll know a few things of the world. And uh, Eve did after that, and so did Adam. Terry from Illinois, would you please explain Psalms 23? That's, that's one of my favorite psalms. Uh, it follows 22, which is the crucifixion of Christ. 
Psalms 23 is the great good shepherd to Psalms. The Lord is my shepherd. If you're a lamb, which God calls us, who protects you? There's only one protection. It's the shepherd. He prepares green pastures. That means he really feeds us good from his word, spiritually speaking, to the point that we can walk through the valley of the shadow of death, which means all these people that are spiritually deader than a hammer, that we can walk among them and have the inheritance and help some if they allow it. And he, he provides us the table that runs over, our cup even runs over. You got more of everything. Truth of God's Word, and you know that He comforts you. That's Psalms 23. It has to do with resurrection and into eternal. He gives us life. It's not just life in the flesh. It's life eternal. Jeffrey from Pennsylvania. Will each person's memory of the world that was be restored in the millennium? Absolutely. And that flesh body and that spiritual body, rather, you know everything. Okay? There's no uh, hang-ups. Alan from Washington, is there any biblical significance to eclipses? Well, we know as it's written in the first chapter of the great book of Genesis that God created the sun and the moon and the, for signs and seasons. Uh, sure, they, they are signs. Or, you know, any, anyone that understands real good horticulture knows when to plant, when not to plant when to plant this and not that by the moon. And many might say, well, that's the silliest thing I ever heard of. Well, hey, have you ever lived near the ocean? How, what does the moon do to the water of the ocean? How many feet does it raise that whole millions and billions and billions of tons? It can raise it five feet in one night, just choo. Well, what do you think happens out here in the farmland to the water level? The moon changes it. And if you're going to plant root crops, you better know when to plant if it's kind of a dry year if you want to be successful. So it's there for signs, but religious signs? Well, possibly. Doesn't hurt to look at it. Barbara, in Luke 9.62, does this mean if someone is a backslider, uh, they cannot be forgiven for this, I, I, I'm confused. Well, uh, you know, this is one reason that farm people have an advantage over city people when it comes to understanding God's Word. And, and uh, it says there, if you're plowing and if you look back, the spiritual connotation is that if you're doing God's work and you're making headway, but if you begin to look back at all you had, you know, in the world of sin, of, of following Satan, um, that you, you're kind of lost. There's no forgiveness for that. But what it means, if you are plowing, picture a walking plow. It has a wing, and, and it has a, uh, the correct name is escaping me, it has, where the, the point attaches and there is a blade and man, if you lean that, it's like on a water ski or a jet ski. When you lean it, it's gone. And if you've got those big handles coming up from that point and you turn and look back, you can't hardly help but plow crooked. You, you're, you're, there's no straightening it out. You're lost. Don't ever look back when you're plowing. That's what it means, and only in a spiritual sense. Uh, Unfortunately, wouldn't it be nice if we were all perfect? We're not. But um, uh, it, um, thank God that He comforts us and forgives us on repentance. Gerald from Illinois, were you taught the way you teach now or were you self-taught? Thank you and your staff. You are, so, you are so welcome. It is natural that, you know, when you are taught the basics, I suppose everyone, roughly the basics are close. But if you, like for example, I've taught somewhere over 50 years. Well, naturally, if, if you're a good scholar, you're going to be self-taught after a year or two because you're going to go way on past and find your own way that God would lead you and bless you. And in that, 
uh, four years uh, of um, of uh, being educated in man's schematic, yours probably will take on its own color, shape, and form. Um, I personally at this time uh, and have for many, many years will not read another man's work for this other than God's because other people's schematics can help you from doing creative teaching. That may sound, that may sound wrong uh, now that I think as I've said it, but you want to be influenced by God through the Holy Spirit and utilize the tools that you have to stick to the language that He spoke in and that it was delivered in so that you know for yourself that you're not misleading someone because those that mislead people are in dire danger. And when God blesses a person or a ministry with a platform the size of ours that goes all the way around the world in millions and millions of homes, to misteach would be a great sin. So you have to do your own homework to know you're right, okay? Uh, Christy from Nebraska, would you please explain the angels that are born of woman? I don't understand. Well, I don't either. There are no angels born of woman, okay? That was, um, if, uh, well, now maybe I know what you're talking about. They're not called angels anymore, though, okay? They're all, when God said, uh, the Hebrew word is Elohim, to, to the Elohim, let us create man in our image. It's God and his children. That's what Elohim means, plural. And that's exactly what he did. He, cre he created us in his own image. But the, and I don't know if you're trying to say the fallen angels. You can read of that in Genesis chapter 6 and maybe found this a little more. There were Geber, not angels, born to them. They were hybrids. And that's why God brought about the flood to destroy them all. Andy from Ohio. What book study best describes that angels don't have wings? And what do you tell someone who has talked to a person who claims that they are a prophet? Ooh well, I, I don't know. Uh, there are not any prophets walking the earth today, unless, unless you want to translate the word prophet to be teacher, okay? Uh, God sent us the prophets, and you have teachers of the prophets. I'm a teacher of the prophets. That is to say, I teach what Isaiah taught, the prophet. I teach what Ezekiel, the prophet, taught. I teach what Jeremiah, the prophet, taught. I try my best to. But um, Jesus said in Mark 13, when he warned us of the two tribulations, he said, Behold, I have foretold you all things. That means this word is complete. And when God gives you unction, then so it is. Now, uh, when, how, what proof do you need in the Bible other than what I quoted just a moment ago? Now, I, as an individual, I was created in the image of God and the angels, okay? Myself, the soul that was there. Now, if to be created in the exact same image. Do you see any wings on me? I mean, do you, have you ever known a human being that had wings? Now, I've got a set out in the hangar, okay? The, and I love to fly, love those wings, but they're not attached to me, okay? No, that's why if, uh, it is a strange thing that uh, God appeared in a vehicle that was circular and had windows and you could see people inside there and when that thing turned, those people turned too. Isn't that a good thing? Otherwise, they'd have went zonking right out on their heads, okay? Ezekiel described this and he had never seen anything but an ox cart with wheels on it. And he did a pretty good job. But when it let its landing gear down, then the, uh, how would you describe something that was flying if all you ever knew that could fly was a bird because it had wings, okay? So it was said that the cherubims had wings because they were flying, but it was a vehicle that was flying them, not wing wings. Ruth from Indiana, when we die, do we go straight to paradise or do we stay in the ground until the Lord comes back? 
Listen, you have two bodies. One goes in the ground and it stays forever. It goes back to dirt and that's it. That's all it is is dirt. And the other is your spiritual body instantly steps forward and returns to the Father that gave it and you're happy as can be. Flesh is not all that... It's fantastic. I, I don't want to say that because God created these bodies and it, it's really kind of amazing when you get... You know, you got fingerprints here, and a lot of people think that's because God wanted to identify you to the police. That's not the reason. It's so you can pick up a piece of paper without it sliding out of your hand like that. And, and then, you know, he put these little old hairs back here. That's, so if I, if I were to open this desk and I reach in there, and whew, that's closing on my hand. Those hairs warn you, you're getting in a tight place. Move, okay? Or uh, God created, and, and it's just like an old cowboy that picks up a hot horseshoe. It don't take him long to say, drop it, turn it loose. It's hot. Okay, he, he made these old bodies pretty good, but when we're done with them, we're done with them, and we have that beautiful body that returns to heaven. So the answer is, Ecclesiastes chapter 9 explains what happens to your flesh body, and Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 6 and 7 document what happens to your spiritual body. It returns to the Father, and thank God for it. We're out of time. Hey, don't miss the next lecture about the two uh, tribulations. It's extremely important in this generation. Uh, we, uh, I, I love you because you enjoy studying God's Word. You know what's more important? He loves you for it. Do you know something? It makes His day when you pick up the letter He's written to you. You know, if you write a letter to a loved one, don't you feel good knowing they're going to read it? Do you know how many people he's written that letter to and they've never picked it up? Think about it. It makes his day when you especially study it. And when you make his day, he's going to make yours. Brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you. Most important, this. Hey, you stay in his word every day and it's a good day, even with trouble. Do you know why? Because Jesus is the living word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.